the model prayer. And uh, we're going to just um, uh, pause for a moment and, and look at seven facets uh, in that regard. So, but before we do that, I want to ask you, and you should know the answer. Um, we, we've, Pastor Cornelius um, has said this many times. Prayer is... Right, that's right, David. Prayer is positioning. Well done. And so per definition, prayer is positioning. Positioning in the spirit, positioning yourself accuracy, accurately in the spirit. And um, I just took the liberty and I wrote down what could accurate, accurate positioning mean to you and me um, in, uh, in the natural, right? But also in the spirit. And so I just jotted down five things. There might be many more, but but I jotted down the following five things, that accurate positioning could unlock to you um, opportunities. Right, so um, I shared um, with the, in the first service, I played rugby um, up to grade 10. Don't look so surprised. And I played the, um, the position of center. And, um, and um, I mean, the, the, the nicest thing is when the opponents would pass the ball from their fly half to their center or from their center to the other center, and you are just positioned in such a way that you intercept the ball and you take the gap, you know, and then you just have to get behind the, um, the what's it, the fullback, is that a, the right word at the end? And when you pass him, the try is yours. But it's the nicest thing when, when you're at the right place at the right time and, and you can access that opportunity, right? So, and that has to do with, with positioning, accurate positioning. The second thing is protection, right? So accurate positioning also um, in, uh, unlocks or enables protection over our lives. So imagine there would come a, a big hailstorm while we sit here in the sermon. And, um, and you are outside or your car is outside. Uh, you're exposed to the elements, but if you're positioned under the roof, roof or your car is parked under a roof, there's protection, right? And it's all about positioning, accurate positioning. The third thing that I jotted down um, that's oftentimes associated with, with positioning is effort, the, the level of effort that you put into something. So I want to use this example. If I put my, uh, position myself on a bicycle, and I am cycling back to my, to my house in Fichard Park. I'm going to be all sweaty and tired uh, when I get back, isn't it? But if I position myself in my Fiat, you know, I take uh, the car out and then on the N1 and then in sixth gear. And uh, within a couple of minutes, I'm home without a lot of physical effort. But it's all about positioning. You know, where do I position myself? And maybe you're sitting here and you're tired and almost burnt out and um, don't know how to handle all the priorities. And maybe it's just a matter of repositioning yourself in the spirit, right? So maybe this word is exactly for you uh, this morning. The fourth thing that I wrote down is um, uh, positioning can help us with perspective. If I position myself under that table, um, I won't have a great perspective about what is going on in this venue, is it, right? I'll have very limited view of what's going on in this venue. But where I'm standing now, I've got a great perspective uh, about what's happening in the venue. It's just a matter of positioning there. I'm positioned under the table. Here I'm positioned on the stage. And it just gives me a total different view uh, and perspective on things. And maybe currently in your life, you just don't understand things, right? Maybe things are blurry or confusing to you. And maybe you just need to reposition yourself in the spirit through prayer so that you can get a deeper insight into those situations that might be confusing to you at this moment. And then the last thing that I wrote down, positioning is also for me about authority and stature, right? So if I position myself Next to, I'm working at the university, and I'm positioned myself. I'm positioned next to um, the rector of the university. You know, there are certain reactions from other people because I am associated with that presence, right? And in the spirit, if we position ourselves in the heavenlies with Christ, the King of Kings, it has got a ripple effect 
in the spirit, right? There's recognition in the spirit uh, um, of the company that you, uh, where you position yourself with, right? So, and that uh, means that you can position yourself with depression or with negativity or with all the other um, stuff that you read um, on News 24. I know it's not yours, it's people in other congregations that do that. Uh, or you can position yourself with the truth of the word and you can uh, recognize your positioning in the heavenlies. So those are just five things that I wrote down. Um, keep them in mind as we go through the, through the, um, through the uh, seven fac facets. So it starts in verse 9, uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, where Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. And what is Jesus actually telling us? He's giving us a model, a blueprint of prayer. And this is, please, not a, um, a recitation or a, um, what's a rainpi in Engels? Um, uh, help me. Uh, a poem that you should recite, you know, um, as a habit. This is not what the, the Lord's Prayer is. I believe this is a model prayer that opens us to a seven dimensions of what should function in your prayer life. Um, I almost want to call it seven sort of movements that you can do in the spirit to reposition yourself accurately in the spirit, right? And you need to understand seven facets. So as we go through the word, you might say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We appear, yes, this, this facet, this dimension is functioning well in my life. I can recognize that in my prayer life. But maybe this dimension and that dimension is not so much present currently in my prayer life. And maybe this is then exactly why you're sitting here this morning. So that the Lord comes through His Spirit and underline to you certain dimensions that you can up your game or, or factor it into your prayer life so that you can reposition yourself accurately in the Spirit. All right? It might just be that this is the one thing that you were looking for that you need to access uh, to reposition yourself, and that can unlock a whole lot of other things. So I'm, before I'm going to start with the Lord's Prayer, I'm just quickly going to mention to you the seven facets. Those of you who are taking notes can quickly jot it down. If you can't keep up, uh, don't worry. We will revisit each one of them and um, discuss it thoroughly. So the first facet is um, all about confirming your identity in the heavenlies. Confirming your identity in the heavenlies, number one. Confirming your identity in the heavenlies. Number two is about praise and worship. Number two is about praise and worship. And remember, we're talking about the different dimensions of prayer. All right, uh, so the second one is praise and worship. The third one is alignment and submission to heaven's authority. Alignment and submission to heaven's authority. Alignment and submission to heaven's authority. Number four. Is a recognition of God as the giver of all good gifts. Recognition of God as the giver of all good gifts. Number five, it's all about forgiveness. You asking forgiveness, but also extending forgiveness towards others. That's number five. Number six is all about spiritual protection. Right? Spiritual protection, a strong theme about spiritual protection. And we will talk about that. And then the last dimension is then a declaration of spiritual truth. A declaration of spiritual truth. Right, so are you ready? Okay, good. So it starts, the Lord's Prayer starts with our Father in heaven. And, and so the first dimension Four words, our Father in heaven, but it unlocks to us in our prayer life a very important dimension. And that is, I want to ask you the question, how do you enter God's presence? 
when you enter the presence of the Lord, how do you look at yourself? What is your perception about yourself? So I think there are two ways how you can do this. The one is to enter God's presence as a son of the Most High. Or you can look at yourself and you can enter God's presence as a beggar or a slave. And I have to say, I have seen in my life, in my Christian life, that sometimes people enter prayer and they sort of beg God. You know, they, they enter with this kind of attitude and position as a beggar or a slave. Well, my understanding of the New Testament is different. My understanding is that the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we surrender our lives to Him, God comes and He makes us a new person inwardly. We become children of God. We become sons of God. And Romans 8 says it beautifully. Romans 8 verse 15, let me just read it to you. He says, <clears throat> I'm reading from verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And that literally means Daddy in the Aramaic. Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are God's children. Now listen carefully. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share. Okay, and then he goes on. But the fact is, what it underlines is, if we are children, we've got an inheritance. So in Ephesians 1, um, verse 3, it says, Praise be to God, um, sorry, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, I'm going to share a lot out of my, or, you know, I'm going to share out of my own life um, because this is, this word this morning is also very personal to me. It's something that I am applying in my own life for many years. And so I'm just going to share, take the liberty to share out of my own life. And, and so this aspect is something that, that God has been dealing with me personally and, and with Siobhan more extensively over the past couple of months. And that is, what does it really mean to be a son of God? How do you, how do you look at yourself differently? What does it mean? Well, what God is busy working inside of me, and I haven't arrived yet, but, but it, one dimension that God, I experience God is working inside of me is that, Pierre, you need to understand that, that you've got an inheritance. You are welcome in my presence. I've, Jesus Christ has paid the price. You've got access to the presence of the King of Kings. You're the son of a king. And in that regard, you've got an inheritance. You don't have to slave away. You don't have to beg. You don't have to look down on yourself. Not in arrogance, but with full recognition of what Jesus did and what he paid for. You can access that fullness by saying, Father, Daddy. And giving recognition that I'm welcome in God's presence. So in 2 Samuel 2 verse 9, there's a wonderful story that actually illustrates this beautifully. It's the story of, of Meshibush, help me, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, all right. The English can, the Queen's language can sometimes be difficult. Mephibosheth, all right. And so the story of Mephibosheth is um, he was actually... Um, this dude with the difficult name, he was Jonathan's son. Remember David and Jonathan? He was Jonathan's son, so Saul was his grandfather. So in that war where Saul and Jonathan died, Mephibosheth was a, a small uh, boy, all right, a, still you know, very, very young. Um, and so his caretaker took him and she ran away, she fled. And that was necessary because in that time, what they did when one, one ruler took over from another, 
um, the new ruler would actually go and he would kill all the descendants of the, of the previous ruler to make sure that he hasn't got any competition. That was custom in that time. So it made sense that the caretaker of Mephibosheth, who took him as a small little boy and ran away to protect this, this, uh, this young guy. And in the process, she stumbled and she fell. And he got hurt up to the point where he became crippled and, um, and, 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 and became disabled. And so um, many years after that, um, David unified the kingdom. He was not only the king of the Judah, of the Judah tribe anymore. He, he um, unified his kingdom over the whole of Israel. And after he'd done that, he said, is there any descendants from the lineage of Saul? Go and look for him, for somebody. And, um, and they were, looked all over the place and they found Mephibosheth. And what did David do? He called him into his palace. And of course the expectation would be that he would kill him. And, um, and he did the opposite. He said, Mephibosheth, I'm going to restore to you your full inheritance. I'm going to give back to you what belonged to your grandfather and, um, and to your father. I'm going to restore your full inheritance. And not only that, I'm going to treat you as a son. You are now, from now on, going to eat. You're going to sit as a son um, at my table as the king. And, uh, and you are fully welcome in my presence in the palace. And isn't that exactly what God did for us in Christ Jesus? Amen. And you need to get that in your prayer life. That God restored your inheritance in full. You don't deserve it. You and I deserve death. But God restored your inheritance in full. And more than that, he welcomed you in his presence. And as a son of the king, as a prince, you are seated in heavenly places. And so you need to understand this, that the, in your prayer life, when you enter God's presence, you do it through the blood of Christ, but you do it as a son. Amen. And may God open up this dimension more and more to you so that you don't enter God's presence as a slave begging for his attention, but that with full boldness and with love you can enter his presence as a son of the Most High. Amen. The second aspect is all about praise and worship. So, of course, it starts with our Father in heaven, and then it goes on to say, Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. So this is a dimension in our prayer life where we focus away from ourselves, we focus away from the stuff that is happening all around us, and we put our focus on Him, and we praise Him because He is the only one that's worthy of our praises. Amen? So this is a time in my prayer life where I just metaphorically move away all the stuff off the table that clutters my life, and I, I just focus on him, and I just say, Father, you're marvelous, you're glorious, I glorify your name. You're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, you're amazing, you're glorious, and, and you, just, you just worship him, and we just need it so much, because so oftentimes our lives get cluttered by everything around us. We are so intimidated by all the stuff that we hear, and you know, all these giants around us, and sometimes what we just need to do, we need to access this dimension in prayer by shifting our focus and understand that there is somebody sitting on a throne that's sovereign and all-powerful and that's still in control. Amen? Psalm 2 says that God sits on his holy throne and he laughs at the nations. So if you thought in your mind that God is out of control, by looking at the news, I've got a surprise for you. He is sitting on his throne and he's completely in control. And we need, in, for our own sake, we need to, um, to glorify him as such in our prayer life. So um, there's a scripture in Revelations, uh, Revelations 15 verse 3 to 4. Let me just quickly go there, and uh, I'm going to read it to you. 
So the setting is, the context is that this is in heaven. It's, um, you know, at the end of everything. There's a great multitude before God. And now suddenly everybody is understanding everything, right? So you can imagine, you know, everything is over and done with. It's the end. We're standing in God's presence. Just picture yourself there. And suddenly you understand everything is now clear to you. And the people can't help themselves but ex exclaim the following. And these words are great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. So what is happening here? People are saying, you know what, when I was still alive on earth, I didn't understand this. I couldn't understand God's act in this, that specific period of my life or in this area of my life. But, oh, yeah, 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 now I get it because now I see clearly. And God, I just worship you. I can't help but glorify your name because what you did throughout my life and throughout all the ages, it's just marvelous. It's amazing. I worship your name. This is what is happening here, right? And you and I will do that when we stand face to face with God and understand everything about how great he really is. But you know what? We've got the opportunity right now in the midst of circumstances that we don't understand to do that, to glorify his name. You might never have the opportunity ever again to glorify God in your particular circumstances that you find yourself in right now, ever again. It's an opportunity to praise his glorious name, even though stuff does not make sense to you. Are you going to grab hold of that opportunity? Rick Joyner writes about this, and he says, don't waste your trials. By just going through your trials, complaining, feeling sorry for yourself, don't waste it. Use it as an opportunity to glorify God's name. Hallowed be your name. It literally means that I take God's name, which represents his character, and I separate it, I put it aside to be lifted up and to be glorified. That is literally what it means. So Andrew Murray, I wrote, I jotted down a, a quote from Andrew Murray. I've got a lo lot of respect or, for the stuff that he wrote, especially on prayer. And he said that, learn to worship God as the God who does wonders, who wishes to prove in you that he can do something supernatural and divine. Isn't that beautiful? And the moment we glorify God as such, Something shifts inside of us. We are repositioning ourselves in the spirit because we understand there's somebody that's fully in control and that's sovereign. Maybe that's the perspective that you need in your life, in your particular circumstances. So the third dimension or the third aspect of prayer is... Um, Illustrated by, the, by verse 10, it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is a time in our prayer where we submit to the sovereignty of God. It's a time in our prayer where we take every facet of our lives and the people that we are praying for, and we are aligning it and bringing it under the rulership of God. It's a time of submission. It's a time of alignment. It's a time of, you know, just bringing everything, um, realigning everything under his authority. So this morning when I prayed, uh, this morning early when I just prayed and prepared in the spirit for the sermon, um, I just experienced the Holy Spirit reminded me about the scripture that was not in my notes, and I think a very important scripture, and I'm going to read it to you. Um, hopefully it will make sense and break this open 
in a new, fresh way to you. So it's, um, the scripture is in Matthew 11, verse 12. And it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. And what the scripture actually then means is that there's a forward momentum. Uh, let me put it differently. The kingdom of God, meaning the sovereignty and the, the rulership of God in and of itself, has got a momentum of its own. And what the scripture says from the time of John the Baptist, that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. It's breaking open a way in a momentum moving forward and demolishing any opposition in its place. And then it says, and the and forceful men lay hold of it. And what it then means, it actually means that, and those, so the kingdom is advancing, it's pushing forward, there's a momentum of the rulership of God, demolishing any opposition, um, just like a, a, a boat moving forward and breaking the ice in front of it. So the momentum is there. And then it says, and everybody that focused their full attention on this, will become part of this momentum. This is what, and the forceful take hold of it. It means that if you put all your energy in and your focus, you can latch onto this momentum and it can pull you along. If you don't do that, you remain behind, okay? So this is wonderful news, Christy. It means that God is winning. And his kingdom is forcefully advancing and it's demolishing everything and it's moving forward and there's an upward trajectory and we know what the end will be. And God says, if you and I in prayer focus our attention and bring every aspect of our lives aligned to that, we can jump onto this momentum and we can be, become part of it. That is what it means to, be, be, to become a co-worker of God. So in this time of prayer, I am... I'm sharing out of my own life. I'm saying, God, first of all, I'm taking every thought captive of myself to be obedient to the voice of your Holy Spirit. Lord, any high thing that exalted itself in my life against your will and against your plan, I cast it down in Jesus' name. In every plan of the devil that's directed against me and my family, I break it in Jesus' name. Lord, I resist the devil and I submit myself under your mighty hand. And I bring in myself and my family, and my loved ones, and my marriage, and you in this congregation, and my workplace, and this country, and our government, and our provincial government, and our municipality, and everything, I'm bringing that under the authority of God, and I say, God, let your kingdom come, and let your will be done as it is in heaven, because that's the place where it's perfectly operating. In that same way, let it operate in my life and in my marriage, and every person I'm praying for. This is a place of alignment, a dimension in your prayer life, where you align everything so that you can become part of that wonderful, victorious, positive momentum that's demolishing everything else um, that's in standing in its way. It's called the kingdom of God. It's your inheritance. Are you accessing that in prayer? If not for you, I'm begging you, do it for your children. And for every aspect that you are complaining about. In prayer, somebody once said, prayer activates God's arm. And when you pray that, God takes his arm and he brings, without you understanding it, he brings those facets and those people and those situations under his authority. And his rulership will demolish every opposition. Amen. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's also a time in our prayer where we need to get quiet and ask God, God, but what is your will? Right? It's a time where we need to silence ourselves and hear what God is telling us what his will is in situations. Are you doing that? Do you get word from God about your finances and things that, you, that are troubling you? 
Are you taking time to get quiet and just hear God's voice? Because prayer is not a monologue. It's a two-way conversation. Right? And part of prayer is also hearing God's voice. Andrew Murray wrote, he said that prayer is not a monologue, but a dialogue. God's voice um, is its most essential part. Listening to God's voice is the secret of the assurance that He will listen to mine. Amen? And so if you struggle to hear God's voice, um, there, there are wonderful subjects that, um, that we present um, at Creare and at this church. Um, this holiday school is coming up, and maybe you should enroll for that. Amen. Those of you who said amen, uh, <laughs> it means let it be like that. All right, so um, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're back at the Lord's Prayer. The next facet is, give us our, today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. It's a time in our prayer life that I mentioned where we acknowledge that God is the giver of all good gifts. Right? He is the source and everything that I am, everything that I own, everything that I have, everything that I accomplish, everything in my life is but by the grace of God. It's not out of my own goodness. It's a place where we get perspective, where we deflate our own self inflation and we um, we just get everything in perspective that he is the giver uh, of every good gift james 1 verse 17 says let me read it to you it says that um, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows does not change like shifting shadows. God's character does not change. He remains a good God. If you ask him for a bread, he will not give you a stone. If you ask him for a fish, he will not give you a snake. He is not like that. He is a good God. And so this is the place where God wants you to voice your needs and your requests to him, to lay it at his feet. Right? He is trusted, and you can ask him that. But this is also a place in our prayer life where we express our gratitude and thankfulness towards God. So sometimes I would, in this part of the prayer, I would just thank God for things in my life. And sometimes it's not big stuff. Sometimes it's small things like, God, I just thank you for food. I'm working at the university and um, almost weekly, I, I almost wanted to say daily, but, but let me be safe by saying almost weekly. We are dealing with, with many, many students that just don't have food. And of course, that's a representation of, of the broader society out there. You know, and just to have food on my table, I'm so thankful that God is so good to me. Who am I? I'm, I'm not anything different than anyone else, but yet I have food in my fridge and on my table. I've got clothes. I've got, a wonderful, I've got a wonderful family. I've got beautiful children. I've got health. God is good to me. And, and when I start to thank Him for the things, for the many blessings He's just pouring out over my life, you know, I just, I just realize I've got nothing to complain about. This is an antidote against, um, against continuous complaints in your life. You know, one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is to lure you to become ungrateful and to start to complain. And you know what happened to the Israelites, what, what, what that caused them. Forty additional years in the desert. You know, so may God help us. So this is a dimension that you and I need to access uh, that can become a very important antidote in our lives so that we remain thankful and grateful for the goodness of God in our lives. But it's also a place where we can lessen our anxiety. Let's face it, you know, you and I are exposed to the same economy. There are stresses that we have to deal with, especially as parents. This is, a, this is the place where you can bring those requests to God. He hears and he listens and he provides in ways 
that you won't even, you, you, you will be marveled at. Amen. He's a faithful father. Bring your requests to him. You can trust it, him with it. The next aspect is, um, <clears throat> so we said, give us today our daily bread. And then he goes on to say, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts um, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So this is the dimension, the fifth dimension in prayer, where we need to um, extend forgiveness to others and ask forgiveness from God. One of the saddest things that, uh, that I have observed and experienced as a Christian is to see how the enemy sows a seed of offense in somebody's life. And because that person does not deal with it immediately, he allows it, he harbors it in his or her heart, it grows. It's like a seed. A offense is like a seed. If it enters the heart and you don't deal with it, it grows. And it develops into what, it, what the Bible calls a root of bitterness. And it's a terrible thing to see that happening in somebody's life. It's like as if that guy's face literally changes. I mean, if you meet that guy a year later, you can't believe the words that's coming out of that person's mouth. Or, or the attitude or the, the things that that person says. And I'm saying this with fear and trembling because I know I'm a human being and I'm exposed to that dimension. So therefore, I have to be very careful. But in his love, God gave us this dimension in prayer where we can extend forgiveness to other people and we can ask God for forgiveness for our own sins. So what I personally do in this time of prayer is I picture a court case, right? Because this is actually what forgiveness is all about. It's all about the following illustration that I'm going to give. I am standing here, and the temptation is to be the judge, right? And David did me wrong. And so, you are wrong, and I find you guilty, and because you are wrong, there's going to be a sentence. And your sentence for what you've done to me is that, I am going to withdraw my friendship from you. I'm going to ignore you. That is your sentence. You're going to pay for what you did against me. You have hurt me, and this is your sentence. I'm going to withdraw my affection and my friendship towards you. You're going to pay for that. And you're going to keep on paying until I feel satisfied. That is what we call unforgiveness and judgment. Right? Stop. The alternative to do alternative to that is that yes you have hurt me deeply what you what you did was wrong and it was ouch but you know what i am not the judge i'm going to leave this judgment seat and i'm going to climb down and i'm going to tell you just put it on your <clears throat> i'm going to tell you that you can you can stand up out of the accusation seat, and you know what? You don't have to pay me anything back for what you did. There's not a sentence on what you did, the, the wrong that you did to me. I forgive you. You can walk out of the court. And while he's walking out of the court, I pray, Father, that you will bless that man, that he will be successful, that you will bless, that he will know you more, that you will bless every facet of his life. You're free. You can go. Why do I do that? How can I do that? Especially when people deeply hurt you. Because you recognize that the, the fine that he had to pay for his sins, the price that he had to pay was already paid for. It's a recognition of what Christ paid for on the cross. It's enough. It's cancelled. You can go. I recognize what Christ did on the cross for him. And then I am free. I can turn to God and I can say, God, ouch, that was Ena. He really hurt me and come through your spirit and heal me. 
I can't do that when I'm the judge. That is what forgiveness is. So Jesus says that the same measure you use for others will be measured unto you. So when I have used this, the blood of Christ, as a measuring rod towards David, he's released, he can go. God says, when you turn to me and you say, I'm sorry for what I have done, and I'm a human being, I make many mistakes. God says, well, you have used the measuring rod of the blood of Christ towards David. He's released. I'm very happy to use the same me measuring rod for you. The blood of Christ equally applies to what you have done. And vice versa, the other way around. How can you and I ask for forgiveness from God to be pardoned for what, what we do? The many sins and the many mistakes that I make as a parent on a daily basis, that I just make as a human being, I ask God, God, forgive me and cleanse me. I'm sorry I was wrong. I lost my temper. How can I expect God to release me and not hold that accountable and make me pay for that? But yet, towards David, I'm not willing to do that. So God says in that dimension in your prayer life, you need to sort it out. You need to deal with those small stuff, those small offenses, the small offenses and the big offenses. You need to deal with it immediately that it doesn't grow in your heart. I pray that God through His Spirit will access and activate this dimension in your prayer life. Amen. That the devil will not get a hold of on us anymore in this area. In Jesus' name. Amen. The second last, the sixth dimension, is um, um, illuminated or illustrated by um, the following words. Verse 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. It's first of all acknowledgement that there is an evil one and there is temptation out there. I don't know in which world you're living if you're ignoring that, but I'm certainly exposed to onslaughts of the enemy, temptations that he brings along my way, to, um, temptations of many sorts, and just the opposing work of the enemy. You know that? The enemy is angry and he is out to frustrate and to oppose any work of God. And if God is working in and through your life, you're part of that. He does not like it uh, when God works and when God's kingdom is advancing in and through your life. He will try to oppose it. And because that is a spiritual fact, and there's a demonic world or a spiritual world rather operating, not only demons but also angels, because that is a spiritual reality, you need to access this dimension in your spiritual, um, in your prayer life, where you say, God, I am seeking shelter in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm running to you that you will protect me. My fight is not against flesh and blood against that family member or that colleague or that politician or that the pointing of the finger it's not against people it's against spiritual forces that are operating through people and the moment you get that you run to god and his name is a strong tower you need to understand like um uh, um Psalm 5, the last verse in Psalm 5 says, God encompass you with favor as with a shield, that you are safe in his presence, but you need to access that and, 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 and um, yeah, sort of just position yourself there, you and your family and your loved ones and the people that you're praying for. Amen? That, that, God's, that, that God will encompass you with his presence and with his protection. I think this is so important because... Um, this deals with our arrogance. You know, I don't know in your life, but in my life, I get hurt when I become arrogant. When I think I can do this and I can just storm forward and I can deal with it and I can, you know, I've got all the answers. No. 
You need to understand that, that the Bible says that, that the, the devil is walking a, a, around like a roaring lion. And, and you need to tread carefully. I'm not saying this to invoke fear in your life. I'm saying this is a spiritual reality. And we need to access this dimension in our life. To access discernment in the spirit. And to walk accurately with God. That we enjoy his continuous protection. Amen. And so it says, and lead us, and this is what we ask God in prayer. Lord, lead us not into temptation, because we understand there is a risk of that. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There were times in my life where there were temptations that I could not deal with. Where I realized that this is too much for me. This is overwhelming and too powerful for me. And where I had to go into my inward prayer closet, chamber, and on my knees, ask God, call upon God, reach into heaven, and just say, God, this is too much for me. I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this temptation. If you're not helping me, I'm going to fall. And then God does it. God does it. And may you, when you face those temptations, not fall for the, for the tricks of the enemy, but may you run to your strength. May you run to God and find your strength in Him. He's ready. He's standing there. The hero of heaven is standing there to put His full strength to the fore to help you in that regard. The last dimension is all about confirming or confessing what is true in the spiritual realm. And this Bible, this translation, NIV, does not have it in it. Some translations don't have it in it. But I believe it's part of the Lord's, Lord's Prayer. And it ends off by saying, because to you belong the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I think that's an important aspect of our prayer life where we need to take the truth, the spiritual truth of who God is and what his word says and declare that out loud over situations, over people, over um, our country. Where you just in that part of your prayer life declare the truth of his word over the facts of situations and what sometimes what, what intimidates us. I think it's an important dimension of our prayer life and, and it, will, it, will, um, it will mean that you literally take a portion of scripture and you pray it out loud. Ask God to give you a, a, a scripture over a person that you're concerned about or over a situation, situation that you're concerned about and you just, you just pray it out. You declare the truth of his word over um, a, a specific situation or a person. A good example of this, maybe something that you can use, you, that you might find helpful, is Ephesians 3, verse, um, from verse 16 onwards to the end of the chapter. If you, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. You should write this down. This is helpful. All right, so I'm going to pray. For, um, for David, okay, I'm, I'm picking on you today, but it's good, um, in a good way. So, so Father, um, and just agree with me as I pray this. So, Father, I pray that out of um, your glorious reaches, you may strengthen David with power through your spirit in his inner being, so that Christ may dwell in David's heart through faith. And I pray um, that David will be rooted and established in love, and that David may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and so that David may know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that David may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of you, O God. You know what I've done? I've just spoken truth over him. I just released truth over him. And God's word is living and active. 
And while I did that, the Holy Spirit will move upon the word and he will use that as material to bring about the change. And tomorrow when I meet David, in a week from now, tomorrow or in a week from now, he just, he's different. Why? Because I've declared spiritual truth over him. And you can do that in situations. Uh, you can do it over countries, over your workplace. You just declare the spirit. You just declare the truth. Because the truth will always win. Light will always drive away darkness. Amen. And this is the last dimension, the seventh dimension, which I believe is crucial in our prayer life. So just in summary, we said that prayer is positioning, positioning in the spirit. And there are seven dimensions or movements that we can access to make our prayer life full. The first dimension is um, to con just confirm our identity in the heavenlies, in, in the heavenly family, just to confirm our identity, our Father um, who art in heaven. The second one is um, all about praise and worship, glorifying his name, hallowed be your name. The third dimension is to align ourselves and to submit ourselves to the sovereignty and the rulership of God. Every aspect of our lives, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number four is really just acknowledging that God is the giver of all good gifts, thanking him for his goodness and his grace and what he gives us, and also asking and making your requests um, known to him. So give us today our daily bread. That's what we need. Number five is all about forgiveness, extending forgiveness towards others, climbing off the judgment seat, also asking for forgiveness, using the blood of Christ as the only measuring rod um, um, in relation to wrongdoing. So give, forgive us our debts as we forgive, as we have forgiven those who have um, sinned against us. And then uh, the sixth dimension is um, really sheltering yourself in the protection of the Most High. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then the last one is just a, a declaration of truth over people and situations and facts. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Father, we just thank you. Thank you that, Jesus, thank you that when you were on earth, that you taught us how to pray. Thank you that you provided to us the perfect model to have perfect communion with you. Lord, I just pray for every person sitting here, every person that's accessing this material online. Lord, that through your spirit, that you will just help them to break this open even more and more. Lord, I pray for an intimate prayer life with you. Lord, I pray that, that as each one of us just take the time to spend time with you, to enter into your presence, to have communion with you, thank you that your spirit is just there to lead us and to guide us. Thank you that we have the privilege through the blood of Christ to access your very presence. To know you intimately, Lord, because this is eternal life, to know you, Father, and your Son that you have sent. We just honor you and we glorify you. We want to say we love you in the name of Jesus Christ and in that name alone. Amen.